Well, hello, everybody. Um, this, uh, obviously, tonight's uh, meeting is about um, counterterrorism laws and photography. Um, this particular piece of film that you're going to see was part of an investigation uh, that I worked on with Paul Lewis uh, for The Guardian, which was published in March this year. And it's about um, how police surveillance teams target protesters as well as journalists. Um, now, it's about a six-minute film. It doesn't actually show anything to do with counterterrorism law, uh, but it does show the kind of, uh, I suppose, the front line, for better, better word, of police protesters and the media coming together. Um, the film is shot by the police. It's a police surveillance film that was acquired by The Guardian. Um, and you get to uh, hear some of the officers commenting on what they feel about the media. And you also get to see an ITB Meridian crew being stopped and searched. Uh, by the police when they were leaving the climate camp in Kings North last year. So I forgot to say that this is in Kings North at the climate camp last year. So um, I'm happy to answer questions on this after us as well. Okay? Yeah. It is now 11.37 hours on Friday the 8th of August 2008. I am PC part of the evidence gathering team call sign Echo Golf 05. I'm being assisted today by PC Time is still 11.37 hours and I'm pausing the tape as there is nothing of evidential value at this location. You just heard the voices of two police surveillance officers. Among a growing army of police officers trained to monitor protesters, they were on duty at last year's climate camp demonstration in Kent. Time is now 11.57 hours. We're up at point three, the front entrance to the climate camp site. Time is now 12.48 hours, same location, same date. General overview of persons here. We have obtained their footage as part of an investigation into police surveillance. Interesting array of jewellery. Just want to wait there, please. Yeah. <laughs> the original <laughs> Overt surveillance at protests is designed to monitor protesters who may commit crimes or antisocial behaviour and assist public order operations. But our footage shows the kind of information police are obtaining about protesters. They note down their names, facial features, clothes, and even talk about their past political activity. Okay, so we spent a lot of time um, on Gate 6, blue fence area yesterday. Comes from Stanner Court in Ramsgate. Our investigation has established that surveillance material is being uploaded onto a police database. Police forces across the country share intelligence on campaigners. Officers can use the database to find out which demonstrations an individual has attended. Male in shot now is believed to be subject I, I India. 12.34 hours. No female. It means that you, a law-abiding citizen who attends a rally or goes on a march, could have your private information stored for at least seven years. But this footage shows something else. From the outset, police were particularly keen to monitor journalists. Media covering is now. For a year, journalists have said they felt police were watching them. Senior police officers repeatedly denied it was happening. They will find it hard to deny this. Whenever journalists were in the area, the surveillance lens was pointed almost exclusively at them. In total, police watched 10 journalists. Time is now 13, 13 hours. This is Jason Parkinson, a freelance cameraman whose films have appeared on Channel 4 News and Sky. He stood beside Daniel Berilak, a Getty photographer. The footage Parkinson is shooting now catches the surveillance officers in action. This is Felipe Treba, a Spanish agency photographer. Like the others, he's been asked to show his press card. There can be no doubt he's a journalist. A lot of press officers in and out of the camp today. 
More press officers coming out of the camp now. This is the crew of ITV Meridian tonight. A lot of press officers, aren't they? Just think they're going to be wandering in out of the field. Oh, at the moment. That's wrong, I think. I agree. Yeah, the, uh, okay. the Trust them less than the protesters. The ITV crew were monitored more than anyone else. Time's now 13, 19 hours, same date, same location. Press cameraman here. Being awkward a little, being asked to stand back by officers on at least two occasions, and then asked, asked to stand by the inspector, or asked to by the inspector to stand out of the road, coming out with witty comments. The surveillance officers are distracted by Parkinson and another photographer across the road. You don't like having these photographs taken. Out there with the bald head. They return to the ITV crew when they overhear a discussion about personal details. He's uh, giving him a ticket for uh, the uh, club as to whether or not he wants to see his details. Shortly after this was shot, the camera was turned off, but the surveillance continued. A group of journalists were followed by police to a McDonald's restaurant. There, as they filed their words and pictures, a surveillance unit filmed them through the window. If you are a journalist or a protester who attends a demonstration, this footage is evidence that police will be watching and recording you. Does it matter? Do we care that we're being filmed so much? Um, is it a point that Peter raised a little bit earlier when we were discussing all this privately? Um, is it any different from covering the miners' strike in the 70s or uh, CND um, protests, Aldermaston, Green and Common, um, later on in the 80s when we were photographed and filmed as well? Has it made any difference? Um, or is the state, via the police, too interested in our private lives? Is it getting too close? Is it too um, obsessed with the press when it could be spending time and money fighting crime, even if they're just spending more fighting the kind of petty or volume crime that's blighting the lives of so many ordinary people day in, day out, through muggings and small burglaries? So these are some of the issues that we're going to um, raise today. Um, it, it was quite funny. I'm going to start with Mark since he filmed it all. I mean, you know, and we were all laughing a little bit. Um, but um, is it parochial or do you think that it's just the tip of the iceberg and we should be really worrying, thinking about the G20 stuff that came out today? I mean, firstly, I didn't film it. The US police filmed it. Um, it was their surveillance video. Sorry. It, yeah. yeah. Somebody else. <coughs> Both I, ways. I was in it. Um, I yeah, mean, you after. Made the film. Um, <laughs> Uh, after um, watching that stop and search of the Meridian crew, uh, a bit later on, um, some anti-surveillance protesters um, came out to take pictures of the police. Um, and that appeared, that article appeared in The Guardian last month. Um, those protesters, uh, for, for the crime of taking a photograph, um, were pushed to the ground, strangled, pressure points, uh, thrown in the back of a police van strapped up, uh, spent four days in custody, um, then released uh, after the climate camp had finished. Um, and 
they were charged with assaulting a police officer um, and obstruction, those charges were later dropped and now um, they're taking legal action by the, and, and uh, a complaint to the IPCC. Um, that was a very, very brutal arrest. And I was there that day, obviously, because you just saw me um, standing next to the bald man who doesn't like his pictures being taken, Jason. <laughs> um, we, were, we left that area to file those images because that was very good newsworthy stuff. It was the day before the mass action at King's North. Uh, every journalist going in and out of the camp had been stopped and searched. Um, every protester was being stopped and searched all the week. Uh, that day I was stopped and searched twice. Um, and just uh, let me, and then, sorry to go on, so, so, you know, the, the brutal uh, arrest of these people, went to go and file it. Uh, we delayed an hour by the stop and search, then followed down the road in the, by the police, then filmed by surveillance officers, you know, similar to those officers, while we were using the free Wi-Fi at McDonald's. Um, the reason why the police are doing this, should we be worried about take, being, having our photographs and being filmed? Um, obviously, th there's no right for privacy in a public place. The police are using the same common law that I use in my job as a photojournalist to take pictures, and they are using the same law, and the, pro and the protesters are using that same common law. Um, I'm not particularly interested about being photographed. I'm interested in what happens to that information, and also if the, then the police come knocking on the door to, um, uh, they want to know which journalists are there uh, at a particular event, um, and when they, I mean, I've been approached by the police in the past, could you help us with your in, our inquiries? We f think you photographed a particular incident on a particular protest. You know, so that's the serious side of it. Um, I should say that Mark is, uh, he's a London-based journalist, um, and um, obviously he was watching the surveillance there and helped The Guardian make that film. And um, you're working on a long-term project to document political protest and dissent yeah. in modern Britain at the moment. And, and you have also been arrested, stroke assaulted yourself? No, I've not been, never been arrested, no. um, but I've been assaulted and put into hospital. Okay, and you sued and you were paid? Sued the police and the yeah. police, you know. Yeah. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is we've got t two other journalists here, um, and we'll, we'll hear their viewpoint, and then we'll come to Peter Clark. But the, the um, things I'm interested in looking at here are how far the state is overstepping the mark into our privacy, but also one of the things that you mentioned there, we'll come on to, is the idea that they're using stop and search laws which are now um, being used mainly um, for terrorism purposes. Well, it should be used for terrorism purposes, have been reintroduced to terrorism purposes and, and uh, are now being used against people like yourself. You know, nice cuddly photographers. <laughs> so um, cuddly. I'm going to move on now to, um, uh, to Turi Munt who's Chief Executive Officer of uh, Demotics, a citizen journalism website and freelance photo agency. And uh, presumably, this is the type of thing you're interested in. Very, but from, from, we, we complicate it somewhat. So far as what Demotics does is it, it allows anyone to tell their stories. And what we try and do is allow people to tell their stories safely um, by, anonymizing the, by anonymizing their content when they upload it. So for example, in places like Iran, um, that was, that's been very, very useful for our contributors because they can get their stories up. And these are street journalists, these are citizens, there are people from the street who, unlike professional journalists, were not locked up or kicked out of the country. Um, so we think this serves an enormously useful, potentially useful um, function. The tricky part there, and we have the same issue with the Committee to Protect Journalists, is that essentially we turn everybody into, into journalists or photojournalists. And there, we end up with this, very, with this, this, this issue that the, 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 the terms of the debate that we're having now seem to me between the, rela the relationship between the police and the press. Um, I suppose the question that we would have as demotics would be, why should there be such a distinction between the press and civil society? Now, especially now, that everybody and their grandmother has got a cell phone with a camera on it. Um, and there are now countless ways of supplying that information back to the public. So the dynamics have changed, obviously, as we saw there, because the police may have been filming, but everyone was filming back, so you could see um, what they were up to. But there is a huge difference, isn't there, between what's happening on the streets in this country and what's happening in places like Iran. Well, I mean, this has been quite funny. As soon as this, as soon as this piece of legislation was put into action, we wrote about it, we blogged about it in our community. You're, you're talking about the... About 76. Okay. Um, uh, which uh, stops people from photographing policemen or members of the military service or the Queen, I think. Um, Do you know, I, I'm going to bring Peter in there for one tiny mm. second because I thought we were banned from doing that 30 years ago. We couldn't film a police officer, you know, if he didn't want to be filmed and he was doing his job. 
Uh, well, I must say, it's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just stopped us then, OK. Yeah, it's just the okay. straight go away, you're yeah. being annoying, um, yeah. <laughs> as yeah. opposed to any specific piece of legislation. Okay. So I will come back to you in a minute. Yeah. Um, so do you want to finish just up? Just jump we'll in there, just because, okay. because, it's a little, because it's a little embarrassing. We're the home of, the, of, 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 of liberal democracy here. And uh, this piece of legislation was enacted here. And we had contributors from Egypt, from South Africa, from a variety of different places around the world who sort of sat there going, ha! Huh. And we thought, you know, we thought this only happened Shinu. Um, look, it's happening, happening with you guys as well. So there is this broad sense. And it's happening not just in the UK, it's happening in Spain. My part, business partner's father had his camera taken away from him when he, was, when he saw um, an, what looked like an armed robbery taking place in Madrid. It's, it's, it's happening increasingly everywhere. And, and, it's, um, and it doesn't put us in the camp of the, of the righteous, unfortunately, I don't think. Mm. Now, I'm going to move on to Angus, because you were involved in the G20, weren't you? And so you, um, under other legislation, were moved on at times. And also, we saw there the IT... ITV, ITV Meridian, yeah. yeah I mean, Meridian. I'm, I immediately want to come to the defence of ITV, uh, seeing one of our crews. Uh, I work for IT, ITV News. They're doing nothing. nothing. And actually, I looked up the ACPO guidelines today, agreed in uh, April 2007, which set out a, a sort of... Uh, sort of working rules between the Association of Police Officers and the press. And one of the key guidelines, which I'll read it to you, um, we, the police, have no legal power or moral responsibility to prevent or restrict what they record, they being the media. Once images are recorded, we have no power to delete or confiscate them without a court order, even if we think they could be damaging or useful evidence. So set that against what we've just seen. And I think I've got two points to make, really. There clearly is two uh, uh, precise bits of confusion, if you like. I think there's an emerging confusion on the day-to-day. -day. There's always been tension between press and the police. There always will be. But I think in day-to-day -day working relationship, there's a confusion between what's counter-terrorism and what is public order. And I think there's clearly confusion on the ground about what the actual rules, stroke laws, stroke guidelines actually are. So why do you think those police officers were even filming? Were they bullying? And a, and a point that I'm going to come back and put to Mark is, um, or were they actually just trying to put your name on some database? So do you want to say something about that and then Mark? And then finally we'll go to Mark. Well, I think a, a common feature of any protest, whatever size, and uh, I was at G20, as you mentioned, and many other protests, and I covered counter-terror raids as well as um, the FIT teams, the forward intelligence teams of the police force, usually wearing blue tabards and carrying cameras, are an extremely familiar feature now. And they're there gathering evidence on people who are, uh, if you like, professional agitators or protesters. They're gathering well, evidence on like those. Me too, or? Well, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's, you know, where, who, who, who decides who, who that is? Yeah. At every protest, be under no illusions, there's always a subplot where there is an ongoing battle, perhaps too strong a word, but there are those who go to every protest who want to just be there to see if they can whack a policeman. And I've seen, you know, policemen quite viciously attacked, certainly on G20 Day, I saw four officers being separated from their colleagues and a mob descended and was intent on. I said to my cameraman as we were filming, I whispered, "Is I think they're going to die," and uh, you know it was quite vicious. Yeah. And then on the other hand, there are those police officers who go to protests with a preconceived attitude towards crusties, hippies, you name it, who just want to go and crack a few heads. Mm. Q uh, G20 images ad nauseum. So I think there's that subplot going on, and that information gathering is part of that subplot caught up in it is anyone who wants to go to a protest or any film crew who wants to film it. But nothing to do with, with terrorism? No, no. Nothing to do with And that's with the confusion. And, and in the meantime, what you're saying is that they're actually building up information and making you into something that maybe you're not? Well, I mean, when a police officer comes up to you and goes, hello, Mark, how are you doing? Or hello, Mr. Valet, good to see you. Um, you do wonder where he has that information, especially when you've never met that police officer before. And that would be a forward intelligence officer normally. Um, I've got a colleague who came out of uh, Westminster Tube Station to go and cover an anti-war demo. 
Um, they walk up to him, a group of fit officers. Hello, how are you? They use his name. Oh, we are now stopping you under Section 44 of the Terrorism Act, and they delayed him for about half an hour, and they wrote down the color of his socks. His boot. He wanted to know why one of his uh, laces was a different color, and he said, well, one of the laces broke this morning. I mean, but they, like, they absolutely wrote everything down, uh, and then he went off to go and cover it. He's a you know, member of the NUJ, the International Federation of Journalists, had a UK press card on him. They knew who he was. Um, and he didn't know who they were. He hadn't met them before. Um, so it obviously begs the question, after looking at that, um, you know, and particularly on the stop and search of the ITV moving crew, did they give any personal details, i.e. we want to know who these guys are, so therefore we can maybe add that to something, and then obviously that gets thrown back out into the system. Um, and, it will, you know, and, and that's quite threatening. And I think um, if agents of the state are behaving in that way, letting you know as a working journalist covering public order and political dissent. Um, the protesters are going to do whatever they're going to do. Whatever they do is lawful, unlawful, that's there. The journalists are there to document it, and the journalists have a different role to play. And so often, particularly with the intelligence gatherers, and I, I think the intelligence gatherers um, essentially um, are behaving like a political police force. They, they are targeting journalists in a particular way, they target particular protesters in a particular way, and uh, there's motive in there. Now, is that the individual moral political um, views of that individual officer being translated into their everyday life, or is there something a bit more sinister? And that's not getting into conspiracy land, because that would be ridiculous, but, you know, if someone came up to you and said, hello, how are you, and they, you never met them before, you'd be going, how did that happen? Yeah. Okay. So Peter Clark, um, probably one of the most powerful people um, on the police MI5 side of things, fighting terrorism, head of the Counter Terrorist Command, um, privy to every little secret about the terrorist threat to the UK. We can assume. Um, and uh, presumably at the time quite keen for these terrorism laws to be brought in to give you extra powers to do the job that you wanted to do, you know, under your job spec. What do you say to those laws now being used against people like the people sitting around right. this table? I think there's 101 issues all intertwined uh, here, which we, we need to unpick. Yeah. And if it's any reassurance, Mark, I've never heard of you before this evening. So. <laughs> it's the same thing. Why <laughs> 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 very secret? Excellent. I'm only joking. I think Angus hit several nails right on the head. I think this confusion between counterterrorism and public order demonstration is not helpful. And I have to say, I don't think it's helpful when Section 44 of the Terrorism Act starts getting used in public order situations, because that just adds to the confusion. So I think that there's a real issue here about training, and I think there's some sort of review going on. I mean, if I sound out of date, it's because I did retire a year ago, and so I'm sort of reading the newspapers like everybody else now to find out what's going on. Um, I think that would be helpful if some of these things could be disentangled. What struck me from the film was the sheer banality of a lot of this. Yeah. Uh, it's just incredible. Absolutely. People pointing cameras at each other from five feet away. I mean, what on earth? It, it reminded me of the Berlin Wall 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. More than 20 years ago. It's strange. But, but why wasn't somebody saying, actually, you guys, police officers, there are more important jobs to do, and these, these are yeah. journalists? Well, this is a question of on-the-ground yeah. supervision. And I think, I think it's, you know, after 30 years or so in the police, I know that there is often a disjunction between the ACPO policies, what's written at chief officer level, what's uh, negotiated between the NUJ and the police service and between anybody else in the police service and what happens on the ground. There's often a disjunction there. This is a training, briefing and supervision issue. Uh, I, I would say I, I, I simply cannot take or accept that there's some sort of great state conspiracy around this. If there is, um, then everybody's more organized than I thought they were. And, and yet there is. An, an arrogance about the way, and we, we saw it in, in a much stronger way in G20, about the fact that some police officers really do believe they can come in yeah. and do what they want, and um, they're not going to get into trouble for it. And let's face it, if you looked at that whole Tomlinson case, they really didn't think at the beginning that Absolutely. I entirely agree with you. It's very unattractive stuff indeed. And the yeah. whole business about people hiding their shoulder numbers and this sort of thing uh, is completely unacceptable. And Paul Stevenson has said so himself. You know, it's a but why does it take press intervention uh, 
to stop it happening? Why hasn't somebody within the police? Well, what is it within the police that you know these things don't get stopped until the press take the photographs or intervene in that kind of way? It's it, 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 it yeah. a very good question, um, and a lot of things do get changed within the police service during the normal course of events. Some things, it's difficult to describe. There are some units in the police which tend to be run bottom up instead of top down. And it's, that's where there's a failure of supervision, failure of leadership. And that's, when that starts to happen, that's, in my experience, that's when things start to go wrong and it needs strong intervention to turn the whole thing around. Well, on the public order side of things, um, Commander Bob, Bob Broadhurst, who's the head of public order for the Met, attended the NUJ Photographers Conference a few weeks back. Um, and he was giving a speech to 200 photographers. Um, and I vaguely felt slightly sorry for him having to be in that <laughs> environment. Um, Brave man. But as the General Secretary of the NEJ has said, they'd recently gone to a police meeting when there was loads of police officers. So, um, But he was going down the line in his speech what a legitimate and illegitimate journalist was. Um, and then he got kind of confused about what a UK press card was. And then he abandoned his speech and then sat down. And then he, he did something that none of us in the NUJ could ever do, was unify 200 photographers in one view, who then kind of lashed out at him and said, well, well if you don't know, um, you know how the press card works, the guidelines, and you're the head of public order. And he was the, the gold command for the G20, for the, um, for the Tamil protests. Um, and, and that's very worrying. He's, he's a top guy in public order. Um, and I think I, you were going to say something about demotics yeah, and the G20. Well, yeah, that, I mean, it? what I would say there is jump in exactly on this thing and say that the issue about the press card, we've had this debate on, on demotics. Demotics issues press cards, not because we believe in press cards, but because they help in these circumstances. We don't think we should have to issue anything at all. G20, a case in point. G20, Ian Thomason was captured. His beating was captured by an American tourist on a cell phone. And it was a demotics image, which was the front page of The Guardian of him lying flat out, taken by a street journalist. So this distinction between um, professionals or legitimate, as you, as you this is the, the idiotic idea of a legitimate journalist and a non-legitimate journalist, seems to me extremely dangerous. One of our crews what, what, I, what, I, what I'd like to just throw out here is I don't, I don't particularly understand why um, this specific legislation about photographing police officers, etc., is so useful to counterterrorism itself. So I don't understand it broadly. Um, but what I don't, what I also don't, um, don't understand is why there should be, or there could be, in today's world, a split between this legitimate and I apparently illegitimate journalist. It seems to me really dangerous. Just on that citizen journalism thing, though, you needed The Guardian to put it on the front page. And, you, and Paul Lewis, who worked, I worked with on that particular film that you just saw, is a journalist at The Guardian that has been absolutely leading the, uh, the, the work on under, you know, discovering what actually took place to Ian, uh, Ian Tomlinson. And if he hadn't done that work and if the video hadn't been shown, then Ian Tomlinson would have died of a heart attack and that would be the end of it and he would have been a footnote. So professional journalism comes into play very seriously there. Yeah, which is what the point you were just making there. But are we saying that um, before the days of mobile phones, <laughs> When you know citizen could you know photograph anything that was going on, um, this stuff was happening, and we just were getting the wrong end of the stick because we couldn't prove it. We, we now can, we now can, and no we, now, we now can try to, um, and I think that's a, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, so do I. I entirely yeah. agree. The more objective imagery there is captured of controversial incidents, the better, because it enables the truth to be divined, and that's that's fabulous. I think we just ought to be a little careful about the section seventy six debate. Yeah. Now, I, I don't Which know. Is the this is the yeah. well. What you can photograph, you can't photograph a police officer or whatever. No, it, it, it doesn't actually say that. It, it does, it's <laughs> far too vague as the big problem. Well, no, what it is, as, as I understand it, is an amendment to the, I won't go into all the ins and outs of the Terrorism Act 2000, Section 58, where it's always been an offence to collect information which is likely to be of use to a terrorist. This uh, says it's uh, illegal to elicit I think illicit, or, publish, or communicate information likely to be useful to a person yes, committing exactly. or preparing an act What it's terrorism. aimed at is people who <clears throat> research people from the, and it specifically mentions intelligence agencies, military, and police, I think. And it, it's aimed at the people who are doing the reconnaissance on behalf of terrorist groups. It's, it's adapting the law to the methodology of modern terrorists. That's what it's about. I very much doubted the people who drafted it even th had any idea in their heads that it could be applied 
to press photographers, I, I suspect. Or, or citizens, but clearly you don't but, need a cons massive conspiracy, a state conspiracy, to have mission creep, which is exactly what we described. Well, exactly. Uh, and one has to look and see what the safeguards are around that. And you have to say, well, would the CPS apply the public interest test in bringing any prosecution uh, of, a, of a legitimate press photographer going about their business, or any, anybody taking their photograph, Thank you. taking a photograph in the street, um, if it is for the defense of reasonable excuse as well. I, I couldn't imagine a prosecution going ahead. And if you think of the one case since this came into um, uh, onto the statute book in February, where you could say somebody took a photograph and distributed it in a way that was likely to be of use to terrorists. It was a certain photographer in Downing Street who took a picture of Bob Quick and decided to send the details of the confidential operation around the world. That was of use to terrorists because, well, if I read the paper and it said it had compromised an operation. So, but I don't think, if I'm, I'm stand to be corrected, but I don't think anyone's ever suggested that person should be prosecuted for doing that. So is it that um, the police go for an easy target because they're lazy, because it's an easier thing to do? I mean, why are they using that kind of thing to go for people like us who clearly aren't any kind of a big deal or a threat? I, I think, again, it's the disjunction between top and bottom. You've got a young officer who's probably been briefed that this is, this is there and can be used in certain circumstances. And probably, you know, it's a matter of briefing, supervision and misuse. Well, I'm going to come back to bottom up and top down, you know, yeah. communities and um, counter-terrorism. Angus, do you want to add anything there? And I know you want to say something, and then we'll just move on to, one, to the next issue. Uh, I mean, I think um, two things. Not for the first time, the drafting of parliamentary legislation <laughs> has to come under intense scrutiny here. Uh, 76 and 44, as we'll call them uh, with shorthand, are clearly being. So 44 uh, is stop and search, and 76 is. is the photography, or not well, you can could take be it, the yeah. photography of a police officer oh, or, or, in a job. I mean, they're clearly being misused by officers on the ground. As Peter quite rightly says, I think there is a. Uh, I agree with him, there is a problem with a lost in translation between top and bottom. I've read you one of the ACPO guidelines, there's clearly a huge gulf between that guideline and what happens on the ground. I've been stopped um, under Section 44 filming a piece to camera the other day on Albert Embankment with MI5 behind me. Uh, um, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm trying to do a piece to camera which is putting one of our intelligence agencies under proper democratic scrutiny. But, uh, you know, I gave my name and address. If I hadn't refused to give my name and address, I would have been arrested. Um, it's the blanket nature of these uh, powers uh, which are being misused by officers, as Peter quite rightly says, who haven't got the briefing, uh, the correct briefing. I think, and Peter, before we came on, I think, um, I, know, I'm, I don't want to steal words from your no, mouth, no, no. but you suggested you a, solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, a solution. A uh, solution is, is better training. Yeah, I think. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, so, um, for instance, two anecdotes. Walter Wolfgang. Remember the old chap chucked yeah. out of the Labour Party conference? I was there on the day, held under Section 44. Now, uh, a survivor of the Holocaust, um, an elderly man thrown out by men uh, twice his size uh, and half his age, uh, then held under counter-terror laws. There was another guy at that party conference in Brighton wearing a T-shirt saying, arrest Tony Blair, he's a war criminal. He was also held under anti-terror laws. I mean, it's, it's completely uh, misuse of blanket yeah. powers. Yeah. Well, we'll come on to that. Uh, Mark, yeah, just on uh, Section 76, I mean, um, it was originally in the 2000 counter-terrorism powers just for Northern Ireland, um, 58, and then in Section 76 turned it into 58A. Um, and the reason why 400 photographers, professional and amateurs, turned up outside New Scotland Yard on uh, Monday the 16th of February, which was the enforcement day, was because of past experiences of Section 44 being used against photography. I mean, it talks about creating a hostile environment for you know, surveillance and, and, and terrorism. But what Section 44 has done to photography, particularly in London, is to create a hostile environment for photography. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people being stopped and searched under Section 44 in London each year, and uh, you know, a sizable proportion of that minority of that is photographers. Now, that was the concern. It's like we've had this experience. This new thing's coming in. Uh, we're very concerned about it, and there's no bones about it. It has already been used. I know two press photographers who I know personally, uh, both NUJ members, press card holders. They have been threatened with Section 76. One was covering a, a, an eviction 
of a squat in East London and the officer was like, if you don't stop taking my picture, I'll nick you under Section 76. And another one uh, was threatened in a more roundabout way with uh, new counter-terrorism laws, out, on a protest outside um, an immigration centre in um, Bedford, I think. Um, so, you know, Section 44, uh, 76, or you're blocking the highway, you know, whatever it's going to be, if an officer wants you out of the way because you're documenting something they don't want you to document, um, and the government's been very clear on this. I mean, when Vernon Coker was still the police minister, he wrote to the NUJ and said, you know, it would be appropriate for the police to remove the media from a, a location if the police felt the presence of the press could incite disorder. And that's very clear from this government that has brought in all these terror laws um, if they don't want the media there. And, you know, what happened to Ian Tomlinson and what happened to the many other hundreds of people at the G20 is the reason why you need professionals, but also anybody else with a camera, um, you know, and, uh, you know, to document what's taking place. I mean, it sounds outrageous. I mean, Peter, mm. Peter are there times when uh, it really is worth stopping a press photographer or cameraman from filming a police officer? And, and if so, you know, what are those circumstances? The, the, and then let's move on to yeah. uh, Section 44, which I've never heard um, some uh, counter-terrorism officer ever speak against because, you, you know, you argue that you absolutely need it and you need it yeah. most of the time if you <coughs> have the ability to pick up a terrorist that you're, you're chasing or terrorist suspect. Well, no, I mean, if they're suspects, it's not a problem. Um, there's other legislation that covers for this. Okay. Uh, and I, I think it's... It, the debate about 44 has bec become incredibly skewed. It's all about how many people have been, terrorists have been captured by it. Well, probably none at all, I suspect. Uh, it's more about... Isn't that important? No, it's not important. Why? Because, uh, because it, the, the, the power is designed for something entirely different, which is to make it a hostile environment for terrorists. It was back in the Irish days, with Irish looking to bring lorry bombs into wouldn't London. A, wouldn't a curfew? do that. No, no, but it's supposed to be proportionate. Curfew, no, I'm just, you know, no, no, just no, the no. logic. You know, let's keep it sensible. The, the, well. the problem is, is the application of it. The, I mean, the actual Section 44 can't be um, implemented anyway unless the Home Secretary specifically authorises it for a particular area. The problem is when it's used for the wrong things. When it's used for public order and demonstrations and the like, I think that's a misuse, personally. It shouldn't be used. But I think it does need to be there for when there perhaps is non-specific intelligence about a threat to London or anywhere else, then I think you need to have that uh, in, in place. And, and in London, hasn't it been in place for the last three, four years? It gets years? renewed every it month, almost, doesn't it? Yeah, it gets renewed every month, but, so. but it hasn't been for the whole of London. There were times, I mean, I was signing the things a couple but of years not ago. not many. And Most of the time it's pretty widespread and pretty yes, that's month right. after month after I mean, month in London. Yes. A recent and report. there have been times, haven't there, when it's been absolutely countrywide. Um, bar one or two, bar one or two forces where they just said no. It must be something in a book you've been involved with recently. <laughs> um, I think that's on a couple of occasions. I think it was um, uh, done virtually nationally. But uh, no, I, th I, I, I agree that you know, a power should not be misused. Simple as that. I mean, the Joint Committee of Human Rights recent, had a recent report that said counter-terrorism laws should not be used for anything other than to do with counter-terrorism. Yeah, um, I agree. And the issue of function creep, uh, you know, and using, you know, Section 44 against a journalist or a protester because they know that it's a journalist or a protester, I would argue, is a misuse of that law. It's nothing to do with terrorism. It's nothing because of the, the situation or the, the concerns they have because there might be an attack in that area or whatever. I mean, I covered the um, climate camp outside Heathrow Airport in 2007, and uh, I took some very interesting pictures of a forced stop and search under Section 44 when the guy refused and he was, you know, bundled into the back of a police van to have his search. Um, you know, so this is quite serious stuff that takes place. I mean, you know, with, with Section 44 in London, I mean, it is literally just renewed every month, isn't it? And it's the majority of London, and it's a constant. Yes. And I do think it is important to know if anyone has been convicted of a terrorist, serious terrorist offence because of Section 44. No, I mean, I, I think, I, that I is it. I think that's a very valid thing that I think Londoners I, would want to know. Well, they can read Lord, Car Lord Carlyle's reports and review of the, implement the uh, use of the legislation. It's all there in the public domain. But isn't the problem who is the enemy when people like journalists begin to think that they're the people being targeted and the force of the state is you know, against them, yeah. haven't we got it, everything, you know, in the wrong balance? We haven't got everything in the wrong balance. I, I think it needs a 
very good look at and make sure that it's used appropriately. So I entirely agree. And when, when you were in the job, Peter, mm. um, was that your fault? That these laws, which most of I mean, you know, Section 44 was absolutely within your time, wasn't it? Yep. Um, was well, it you? predated me as well, I think. Uh, were you pushing for that sort of thing? I mean, you certainly wanted it, and you certainly didn't stop it being signed, saying, actually, I'm the boss on these matters and we don't need it. So you, you clearly wanted it. Was it you, or was it the politicians? Or were you just no. so focused on what you had to do that, you know, the wider use of no, it really didn't it, matter? It certainly wasn't the politicians. It is not a. Uh, you know, the power obviously is granted by Parliament in legislation, but it's on application by a chief officer of police to the Home Secretary. And uh, some Home Secretaries were particularly um, in, you know, challenging. They wanted to know why. I think it was, forgive me if my recollection's wrong, but I think it might have been David Blunkett who was very questioning. And, wanted, and, and it was after questions that he specifically raised that, that meant in some parts of London uh, were not covered by Section 44 authorizations for a period. And of course, a lot of it as well de is dependent upon the intelligence that's coming in from a whole range of places as to the time frames <coughs> and when it's applied for and its scope and so on. Yeah, uh, breaking news, and tomorrow's Telegraph, it will be revealed uh, that Lord Carlisle told a security conference uh, last Thursday that a former Home Secretary had been stopped under Section 44. Uh, he, all he would say was, he wouldn't reveal the exact uh, identity, uh, but he'd say it, was not, it wasn't a woman, so we can rule out Jackie Smith. But anyway, the mind boggles as to which copper thought didn't recognise the form. I'm saying anyway. Um, so I'd have stopped Margaret Thatcher once on a pedestrian crossing. This particular piece is in good company then. Um, yeah. But I think yeah. what it is is the unofficial application. On the, on the street day to day when we're covering protests and uh, counter-terror raids, it, what's happening is that the, there's an unofficial use of under the counter use by on the street bobbies of of these um, blankets uh, of this blanket legislation and they know that if e even by mentioning if you don't move I can arrest you under section 44 or section 76 they're taking you out of the game now we've got to deliver to a deadline usually that Absolutely. evening now none of us right want to spend the afternoon in the cells and then have to explain why we didn't provide uh, why we didn't file for the 6.30 bulletin or the news at 10, as I would have to do. And another point I'd like to make is that when needed, there is cooperation between us and the police. I can think of a clear example, which is the arrest of the suspects after the 21-7 bombings. Notting Hill, two guys in a flat, um, the police were moving in, armed units, special forces as well, to arrest Ramzi Mohammed and Mukhtar Said Ibrahim. The police asked for a blackout. They got one because they didn't want the guy just. sitting in their flat. Well, you're just about. I mean, there's some frantic phone calls. I think you were involved, Peter. Yeah. Um, yes, there was a certain amount of steam erupting. And, and I think some, pe some people did, actually, break, didn't they? But what astonishes me is that I haven't worked for the BBC for two years. Um, and all these issues were kind of around then, but not the Section 44. We were, oh, right, you know, it was never an issue two years ago. I, I don't think journalists were being stopped under 44 and being moved off um, two years ago. Well, <laughs> could differ on that one. <laughs> maybe the BBC and ITV weren't, and you, you, you're saying you were. Well. But somehow it's got worse and not better. I mean, it's not just terrorism law. I mean, uh, on the day after the G20 on April the 2nd, there was a memorial for the man that died. I mean, at that time, uh, they didn't know that he was not a protester. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a big protest outside the Bank of England again. Uh, a City of London police inspector came up to around 20 journalists, and, you know, in a group behind a cordon. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, I want you to move away for 30 minutes, 200 yards up the road, under Section 14 of the Public Order Act. Of course, being good journalists, we said, why? Uh, what are you going to do in the, this cordon when we're not, or kettle, but I don't want to upset Sue Sims by saying kettle. Um, you know, what, what, what are you going to do in there while we're away? And he said, if you don't go, you're going to spend the rest of the afternoon in the cell. Um, and you, you have to kind of make that decision of like, well, am I going to push this to make a point to actually get this sorted out to prove that you know this shouldn't be used against journalists? And the Home Affairs Select Committee um, report just came out has criticised that use of Section 14 against the media. Um, but then you know we, it was a non-negotiable with us. It was bang straight up the straight up the road. I mean, the officer told me, to, the police inspector told me to shut up. But but I can remember, and again, you raised this, Peter, it, during the miners' strike. Um, okay, I think probably the Sussels, you know, same thing around but they certainly weren't used against us but you know if we were in the way yeah we were completely pushed 
out of the way by the police lines, which existed then. The only difference is there was no way of proving it. It was much more difficult. Mm. Would you I mean, prove that? Yes, I mean, there's now, thank goodness, and that much more visibility of everything through citizen journalism and all the rest. And I think most police officers welcome that. And certainly after 7 7, I seem to remember we opened up a website so that people could send in all their images. Mm. Well, after 7 7, if I remember, everyone was sending their images to the websites that existed, which were ITV, BBC, The Guardian, and, and, and presumably. No, we didn't you, exist yet. you didn't. He said, well, there you go. We all had the websites, and it took you five days to realise, actually, there's, there's that stuff that you needed was yeah, going absolutely. to everyone else, etc. You, yeah, I think things move slowly yeah. in the public sector. <laughs> but that was the first time that actually that kind of citizen journalism was going to help you as well. Yeah. I mean, I think we'd seen it, hadn't we, in the tsunami, but not in the UK not so here. much. Am I allowed a little anecdote from that? Yeah, go, go for it. After the, <laughs> and then we'll have some questions. After the bombing in Tavistock Square, you know, we, we asked for people to come up with their photographs of, uh, um, uh, of the scene because there might be important information there. And, uh, uh, a gentleman approached the, the police cordon and went and spoke to a young officer and said, look, I've got my mobile phone here. Um, I think there might be some relevant images on it. So the officer said, thank you very much, took it and sent it off with a SIM card or whatever to the laboratory for the stuff to be downloaded. And unfortunately, this fellow forgot to, to erase uh, the fact that he's basically a peeping Tom. <laughs> and uh, so, um, I'm afraid he ended up revisiting the police for different reasons. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so but, uh, yeah, there was a, okay. some downside to this. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. <laughs> but I, I just want to raise one other thing, slightly off, off, off at a tangent. This issue of demanding tapes and, and pictures from the press, because um, ultimately, um, most of the time um, um, I've been working as a journalist, you. you cling on to your sources and you cling on to your tapes and you fight as long as you can and then eventually the courts force you to hand them over. And we've had this case in Northern Ireland where actually a judge has said no, she doesn't have to because her life would be a threat. And I just wondered what you all thought the implications of that were, whether it's a good or a bad thing, because that, that is um, setting a precedent. We'll start with Peter. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the, the full facts of the one in Northern Ireland, so I can't really comment on that. In, in general terms, the reason that uh, police are looking for the unbroadcast material is obviously never any problem with the broadcast material, but with the material that hasn't been broadcast is because the question is, is there anything of evidential value there which could assist with the prosecution uh, or not? Uh, and to, actually, the police are duty-bound to make that request. They would be negligent and they'd be severely attacked in court if, if they hadn't made that request then it's a matter for the courts to decide whether in all the circumstances the, uh, the, the application is reasonable or not. Sometimes courts make the orders, sometimes they don't. You were actually involved in that, weren't you, Angus? Well, uh, uh, certainly after G20, we had uh, a request, uh, well, we've had actually a request from the IPCC for our footage, but again, they have to get a court order. I think the unfortunate outcome is that uh, actually, again, on the street during a protest, we are targeted by protesters as well, and this has been going on for many years, um, because it is assumed that we readily hand our rushes tapes over to the police following a protest. We don't. I mean, we fight it tooth and nail. Broadcast material, that's in the public domain. <coughs> but we never hand over our rushes tapes because Clearly, it would make us agents of the state unofficially, and therefore we would become targets. But I'm afraid that people don't see that nuance. And certainly, there is a, a, a split on, on, a, on a, a protest you go to any day of the, the current time between the mainstream media and the uh, citizen media or independent media uh, that, that, that appears. And uh, uh, to me, there's no difference. I mean, we are just members of the public. We happen to have a camera, a pen, and a notebook. That's the way I treat myself. The laws that apply to me are the same as any other member of the public. You know, I don't have any special... I don't want given any special powers just because I've got a press card. In fact, my press card probably is a disadvantage yeah, <laughs> uh, in, yeah. ma in many ways. Turi, do you want to come in here and, as I say, just a couple more, and then we'll take questions? Yeah, I'd just like to back Mark here and say that on Demotis we've had exactly the same issues of people being stopped with just these, 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 this legislation being used totally inappropriately and people being, who may, I mean, the, the idea that people can have their, the professional photographers or street photographers, whatever it is, can have their material taken and examined by the police seems, seems sensible if there's proper cause for it, which point a court decides and gets it on with. But we've, on well, Demotics twice, you've just described two cases as well, of the threat being, we'll just take it, we'll take your stuff right now here and there. 
And it's this, it's the mission creep which is tricky. Um, and um, and it, now I'm, I'm sorry to say, I mean, it seems to me that, this, that, that, that the, the phrasing of 76 is so extraordinarily vague that it allows for this kind of mis 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 misinterpretation. And it's not, it's not good for professionals, it's not good for, um, it's not good for independent freelancers, and it's, and it's not good broadly for civil society, which is essentially what Demotics is engaged in. Do you want to make another comment before I... Yeah, I mean, it's a fundamental principle of journalism to protect your sources and your unpublished material. Um, and the Susan Breen case was very, very important and it was very good that the NUJ backed her all the way and also um, her, her own newspaper and uh, every, every journalist you can think of in the country that did. And that's um, where the courts said, the judge said you do not have to hand your... Yep, she doesn't have to and it was, it was yeah. a great victory for press freedom. Um, I think people don't understand quite who Suzanne. Was Susan Breen case. was. Um, or do you want to? You, 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 well, you I, tell I, the story I you were there. You were there. Uh, uh, Suzanne the Breen is a, a journalist for Sunday Tribune newspaper in Dublin, and um, she's one of those Northern Sorry. Ireland and Irish uh, reporters who would be rung up randomly and given a code word by a terrorist group. And um, just after the shootings of the two British soldiers at Masserine Barracks and Antrim in March, which I was over to cover, um, she got in contact with us to say that she'd been going around Tesco's with the kids. Uh, and on a Sunday, when their phone call, the phone rang, she picked it up, there was a, the code word was relayed, followed by a statement from the South Antrim Brigade of Real IRA which she had to jot down on the back of a cereal box or something. And then she also had received a video of men wandering through woods, balaclavered with um, uh, what appeared to be uh, real automatic weapons. And uh, the police have uh, uh, threatened Suzanne Breen in the last few weeks in Northern Ireland with um, imprisonment if she did not hand over phone records and notebooks and any contacts she had. Well, of course, she fought. And uh, actually, I was one of the journalists who signed a petition that was put around by the NUJ uh, protesting against this, simply because if you allow that to happen, uh, then uh, we will, you know, terrorists will target us <laughs> because we, 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 also, we also become part of the state. We are trying to maintain our position as independent observers uh, who are not you know, completely impartial. We just happen to be, as I said before, members of the public with notebooks and pen. Be there. We don't take sides. You take uh, a point, you take a point that the PSA and I are duty bound to pursue that line of inquiry. They are. They, they are. Have to do it. They are. But I would say um, 3.5 billion will be spent on counterterrorism by 2010. And if the powers of GCHQ, MI5, MI6, and PSNI can't find out who Suzanne Breen was phoned by, then I think we're in real trouble. Especially when <laughs> the maximum. Perhaps you should be reassured. I mean, I should uh, be. Well, especially when the maximum number of people they say that are a threat over there. Well, it's probably about two. I mean, you know, these groups are infiltrated, tiny, tiny. so yeah. that they know what colour pants yeah. these guys put on in the morning. You know, I mean, I mean, leading on that, from this about the idea of police seizing material, um, material is destroyed by the police. Um, and many press photographers over the last few years have experienced where. Um, they documented something in a public order situation or in a train station or you know something going on with someone being arrested and it's uh, delete those images and if you don't delete those images we're going to nick you I mean absolutely no lawful basis to do that whatsoever but when you're surrounded by a group of police officers and you've been threatened and you also know that if you don't format the card you can retrieve the images later on anyway maybe you do a <laughs> tactic I shouldn't have said that um, but I mean you know that's a serious side of it um, I mean journalists do have a slightly different position from citizen journalists in the sense of special procedure material under PACE where um, journalistic material is protected to a point um, but at the end of the day you know I've been in a situation a public order situation like if you don't go away I'll, I'll have your camera off you and I'm like well you've got to go to in front of a judge and explain it but then in, a, in that kind of situation you've got to kind of judge you don't want to antagonize the police officer in that situation you want to get out with your material and get away and publish it um, but and certainly don't want it destroyed and that evidence destroyed of whatever they may or may not have been doing at the time we can I just jump in very very no. <laughs> yes, yeah, go, go, go. We, we spent, when, when we founded Demotics, we spent quite a long time trying to figure out where we'd be best protected in terms of legislation. And our biggest concern was, I imagined, places like Iran, for example, yeah. or Saudi or China, or whatever it was. And the biggest issue for us was to stop foreign governments being able to come in and ask us to divulge information about the information supplied to us. And it turns out that Britain historically has a 
the greatest respect for right for fair trial. So our sense was Iran comes in, Ahmadinejad comes in and says, we want to know who took that photo. Not only from a tech perspective, which we do also, we scrub all the metadata from the images, we anonymize uploads, etc., etc. but from a legal perspective as well, we could say, no, because we know that Britain, more than any other country, would protect the right to fair trial, so wouldn't hand over that information. So we can do it from a tech perspective, we can, but the, 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 the interesting thing here is, is that it's no longer Iran, it's no longer Egypt, it's no it's longer anything UK. else, it's here. Yeah. Anyone in the audience want to um, raise any questions? On this, sorry. sorry. <laughs> and then, yeah. Just uh, with regard to this um, question about there's a problem with briefing officers about press cards and there's a problem with chain of command. I mean, there's no nice way of saying this, but this really is bullshit. For the past three years, the NUJ have been having meetings with senior officers um, at the Met about you know, problems recognising press cards and this kind of thing. Their meetings have been about you know, the general abuses by officers, but also about, in particular, the victimisation of certain journalists, including myself, including Mark, including Jason, who you saw in the film. After the Stephen Lawrence inquiry a few years ago, some new and very urgent guidelines were wheeled out very, very quickly about dealing with ethnic minorities. And at lightning speed, every single officer from every force in the country was given that briefing. Now, three years later, we're still having officers who don't understand what the press card means. We've got Commander Broadhurst, bless him, at the NUJ conference, at the photographer's conference, who doesn't seem to know what one means either. I mean, in 2007, I was covering the G8 in Germany. Um, and there, there were public order situations, which you just, you know, far heavier than anything that we see in this country. Um, you know, outside of Northern Ireland. And f f um, to respond to this, the, the German police brought in 15,000 officers from, you know, the riot squad from Berlin and also, you know, officers from the most rural backwaters in Bavaria and everywhere else. Every single one of those officers, from the most junior to the most senior, knew what an IFJ card was, knew what a press card was, knew, you know, literally every form of journalistic identification. Now, Germany's police budget per head of capita is a lot less than ours. If they can manage it, why the hell can't we? I mean, there, you know, Peter, I did warn you, you're going to be the fall guy tonight. But, but, as but, I also said, I don't care. I, don't care. I mean, if, um, but, it's an interesting but, statement. If you think yeah. I'm talking bullshit, fine, it's your view. Thank goodness you can say. There is an issue over why, you know, why are we the enemy? Well, I don't think you are, frankly. Yeah, but some people out there I'm, act I, as if... No, I'm not agreeing. You and I worked for many years together when I was doing the CT job. Uh, I'd like to think that the relationship that I enjoyed with, with the media um, was a constructive one through all those difficult years when we couldn't say much because of the Contempt of Court Act and all those things. There's a lot of briefing going on, um, and I think there's a, a good level of trust. Public order is a very, very different kettle of fish. Yes, I, I would agree with that, yeah. So I, I, you know, I personally don't recognise the But the enemy thing is more the a state thing, isn't it? The state, it's a state sort of... Y the powers of the state being used against a journalist when actually there are more important things, surely. Angus? Well, I thought there was a key thing you said in, in your question, was that the NUJ has had constant briefings with senior officers, and there is clearly an inability yeah. to filter yeah. down the information. This is a point you agree with, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, filtering from it's senior well, to junior. And that's what needs to be worked on. And Peter was quite right to suggest earlier this evening that we need to start lobbying as a solution for a better training package. Peter, you were talking about your days at Hendon. Well, I remember back in the late 70s at Hendon, you remember what, class number 83 was, this is a press card, and when, when someone presents that, you do this, you let them through here, you give them facilities, etc. so long as it doesn't contradict the purposes of the police operation or whatever the form of words was back in the 1970s. Uh, I don't know what happens nowadays, what the, what the training is at, at ground floor level. I just simply don't know. It was a damn sight idea with fewer media around, of course, and I think that's part well, of the problem, many, yes. is that now everyone's there with a the camera and they just, they've just they given up on trying to pick out who's who. A couple more questions. Also, we'll David. take one from you. David, um, yeah. David, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, well, it's Peter's uh, bottom-up point once more. Uh, Section 76 is actually reasonably well-drafted, and it doesn't stop us taking pictures of the police. The problem is that policemen use it to tell people that they can't take pictures of the police, they use it p to prevent photography, and they do it in the full knowledge that they will be protected from any comeback on that by their senior officers. 
Um, but Tui, weren't you saying there was badly drafted? So there was two with Lee It's extraordinarily open. open. Well. Well, I'm sure it, it, gives, it gives a very strong defence of a reasonable cause. It has to be information elicit, elicited with the purpose of furthering terrorism. It really doesn't, you know, you can photograph policemen until the cows come home. It really doesn't apply. There was no question that if it came to a court case, you would walk away. It, the difficulty is that it doesn't come to a court case. It's used by PCs and sergeants and inspectors on the streets. Yeah to okay. pursue their own political agenda, and they do it in the knowledge that senior officers won't touch them. It was okay, the but. Mets Police Federation that said it was badly drafted. Right. Um, and I think David is, is right. It's not, um, I mean, if it went, you know, if it, David or I went and took a picture of a police officer, which I do many times and we do, um, you know, I don't think if it went to court we would be convicted. But it's, a, it's definitely about how it gets used on the ground in, in so many of these things. Yeah. It's uh, the climate that's created that's hostile to us doing our job. I think that's absolutely right. It is not the, 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 the specific offence itself, which I think, as you point out, would be, we just wouldn't, we'd never get near a court. It is the, the misuse at uh, at yeah. ground level. And if you look over the years at the actual use of terrorism legislation, it's been used at the specific offences, not the powers, when the Walter Wolf gang stuff, I mean, it's ridiculous, of course it's ridiculous, but the actual offences are used with considerable discrimination. Because if you look at the, dr the, the um, definition of terrorism under Section 1 of the 2000 Act, it's very widely drawn. And it could have been used against all forms of protest, dissent, so on and so forth. And it hasn't been quite deliberately, because the, 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 the determination of both the, the, the counter-terrorist police, the investigators, the people I used to work with, and the CPS, who have a sp specific subject uh, section dealing only with counter-terrorism, is to reserve counter-terrorism offences for terrorism and not for things like animal rights, protests, and all the rest, which could very easily have fallen in within that legislation. I mean, the, the, clearly, I think that what you're saying is, I mean, what we've, what we've sort of experienced here has been um, just a massive sort of blanket mission creep of, 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 these power, of these potential powers and a whole bunch of confusion over what they are, confusion which is perhaps more in the, more in the eyes of the, the, the recipients of police bullying than the, than the, than the police themselves. Um, which has been, which you've seen, which we've seen, which you've seen, which we just saw on the video, etc. But there's also, we can't get away from the fact that, and I'm just going back to this, I noted it down, to that, to the text of that, and it's not for the purpose of, of, of creating terrorism, it's likely to be useful, potentially, potentially useful. And there, it's suddenly, Google Earth is, sub, is, 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 is suddenly uh, kind of potentially useful to, to, to terrorists. So uh, almost anything, I mean, it, 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 it's so extraordinarily vague that we, are, and, and that is, I think that's a major problem. So it should, we shouldn't have such wide legislation because it is liable I, I, to create. I think a look at the way in which Section 58 has been applied should actually put your mind at rest around some of that because the, the, the courts have actually drawn it much more tightly than you're describing. A very brief comment. Uh, you're okay, are you, Dave? Because we've got some other questions here. So let's we'll take one there, see what it is, and then if need be, we'll take a couple at a time after this. Um, I think you've also got to remember that this is actually politically a very bad move yes, with this legislation being used in this way. Because if you look at, if you read photography journals or you go around to photography groups in Britain, they're really quite concerned about this. And what's actually happening is, is that through the misuse of this legislation is, is that you're actually alienating people who are just going about their everyday lives where people may need support at a later date. Uh, there's, there's also another side of this that you've got to think on. Now, uh, my previous background was in, was in health outreach work. Now, some of my colleagues, when they're working with gay men and working HIV, would actually go into costuming areas and actually do outright health outreach work and explain what needs to be, you know, give people condoms, lubricant, advice, etc., uh, different addresses to go to for sexual health and things like that. I think something like that model could actually be used in this case where the employers of uh, these different uh, journalists here could actually have a liaison officer who goes directly down to particularly the they can't do it for every single circumstance but for things at a, a medium level and we've got an NUJ rep here as well uh, and they could actually go to these places and liaise with the key people on the ground now, this is a very simple thing to do. It's been done, been done in e different types of industries for generations, and there's a very simple problem if you want to solve it. Well, I thought, you know, people there um, nodding in agreement. Can I take a question here as well? 
but I think that's a, a point that's mm -hmm. taken from the panel here. Cool. Um, I wanted to hear the panel's reaction to some of the uh, claims rev 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 <laughs> revelations made in the BBC Panorama uh, program that was broadcast the last couple of days about what happens to the data that the police collect on protesters at protests and how some of that data seems to be shared with people like E.ON and commercial companies. Now, I'm led to believe by what was in, covered in the, the actual program that that data would be held for seven years. What's E.ON's policy on that? Uh, very good point, and actually we sort of went over it, didn't we? You should have come back to it. So, well, the panel's views? Well, well, Parama got that from the Guardian investigation that Paul and I did in March, but... Um, uh, no it was a, it, the, the seven years thing was from an unpublished freedom of information request that actually came from the NUJ, um, which I was involved in, um, and various senior police officers in public order on the record are admitted to the database. Now um, they talk about the criminal intelligence database um, and uh, how the data is logged onto that from various protests, and this senior officer was talking about. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to be someone who's committed a crime or disorder at a protest. You could be um, hanging out with people that may have or they think may have, and that's a legitimate reason to be on there, and that's all on the record. Um, and uh, I think that's very worrying. I mean, it's, uh, you know, innocent people that haven't done anything wrong being on a criminal intelligence database. Also, out of the Woods case, there was um, a judicial, re judicial review. Um, by a man called Andrew Woods about the, his data being on this database. Um, the police admitted to a public order database in that case, which hasn't been fully um, investigated properly. And uh, questions were asked to Commander Bob Broadhurst at the NUJ Photographers Conference about this. You know, uh, the legal officer of the NUJ actually said, you know, Bob, does any of our, any of our members on, on, on this database? And he was like, well, um, I can't necessarily say they're not. Um, I'll get back to you. Um, so, and it's something that the NUJ is definitely um, um, investigating. But the, um, the, what came back from the Met was the seven years, and uh, that's what the Guardian reported in, in March, and that's what Parama followed on reporting last night. Let's go on to a question over here. Thanks. My name is Tim Gopsall from the NUJ. Uh, it, it seems that what these, these uh, uh, counter uh, anti-terror laws are about is not about arresting and, and interrogating and charging people. It's about a kind of low-level uh, intimidation. Um, and this, I would, as an observation, is one reason why uh, we need professional journalists. We are saying we need the police to be trained. We need the journalists to be trained, too. Um, the advantage of professionals is that they know their rights, they know the law. They know how to deal with um, aggressive coppers. They know how to protect their material. They know how to resist court orders and so on. I think that's a point to bear in mind. But I've actually got a question f about the, uh, the video that hasn't been discussed much itself. And this is about the pixelating of the faces. Um, I know that in the stories that The Guardian has carried from Mark and Paul Lewis, they've pixelated the faces of the coppers. I noticed that in the video, all the coppers are there in full face, but you've pixelated a lot of the uh, protesters and other people who were being questioned. Um, given that these, these events are taking place in public, in the public domain, what's the need to pixelate them at all? And what were the criteria that were adopted in, this, in the Guardian video? Good question. Mm -hmm. Mark, Thanks, you. Tim. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, obviously, I worked on that investigation, and I'm a freelancer. And uh, the editor and the lawyers make their decisions. Um, not one of my photographs has ever been pixelated um, of, a, of a police officer, including photographs that have been published in The Guardian. My understanding was, I mean, I spent a lot of time tracking down all the protesters in the video and getting their permission for us to use it and consent. Uh, and everyone that we didn't get hold of got, got pixelated. Obviously, the police officers were being accused and in particular other parts of the video which were released um, a few weeks ago were being accused of quite serious um, crimes. Um, and I think the concern probably from the edi editors of The Guardian and, and the lawyers was that maybe the police federation representing those officers might come back and sue in one way or form. One of, if, you know, not to get myself into trouble with The Guardian, um, I wouldn't have done it. I think they should be accountable and uh, uh, it should have been published as, as it was. I'm absolutely against it. Angus. Sorry, I was actually asking about your video and the civilians yeah. pixelated in the video. Why did you pixelate in the video? 
There were some um, We pixel places. pixelated the people in the video that we didn't contact, we couldn't get hold of. So you were protecting their privacy, but yeah. Angus, in television you're always pixelating, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, usually, <laughs> I have to say, uh, we pixelate uh, counter-terror officers quite often because we're rung by Scotland Yard's press office and they yeah. request that we pixelate these faces. And even I was thinking Liverpool managed to arrest just the other month some it was guys being bundled into a van outside an internet cafe by officers that we did pixelate. Uh, detectives arriving in Moscow to uh, try and interview uh, Andre Lugovoy, mm. we pixelated them as well because they might be working undercover at future. We, we can see that there's a reasonable request there that might, do we want to be responsible for a counter-terror officer being no, recognised in a future undercover investigation? Probably not. Um, so th I think there is, uh, once again, it's an example of if the police ask you know, a reasonable request. We will comply. There isn't a need to use the sort of low-level harassment that um, was just being spoken about. But on the database, I think that's a really important point because if I just get back to that, because how do we know this database is not being shared with private companies and then not being passed on to the private surveillance companies that these companies certainly employ to keep tabs on the persistent protesters who have every right to be persistent protesters that, that's what we're all about here in a democratic society and i think that is you're starting to get into very murky territory there if it can be proved that these yeah. this police information is being shared with private companies and their private surveillance companies that's a absolute yeah, blockbuster of a story it is but i mean presumably yeah. presumably yeah. That, yeah but is it being used you know by private security it? companies that they employ to actually what do you have to and are we as journalists yeah, being right. robust enough and therefore chasing no. it through i mean is part of the problem that all this is creeping in because as journalists we're just not you know being tough enough and and yeah. really kicking up a fuss when we need to uh, you know Maybe. because the weight of the state comes upon you Okay, lots of questions now. Are we okay for time? Should we just carry on? I'm neither a journalist nor a police officer, but I'm I'm very curious about these um, low-level police officers. They're not senior. We they, that seem to be engaging in this kind of harassment of of the journalists. What do we know about their culture and their motivation for this kind of activity? And when the kind of data that you've just been talking about starts to get shared <coughs> with companies like Ian, well, that sounds to me like a more strategic kind of activity. And so then I feel like it's tempting to think that they're climbing up the kind of hierarchy of the <coughs> police force. So okay. a comment or a question? Uh, yes. Let, let, we'll, I, we'll take a couple of more and then see if it's... Um, if it's Something we can address from the panel. Thanks. How are you doing, uh, Sheridan Flynn? I'm a photographer. Um, just on that uh, database, and uh, to me, it seems as if we're entering this kind of grey area of legality where there is a mix of innocence and guilt. With um, the emphasis being on guilt, it's it, you know, with, with databases and you know, intimidation by police using this very wide open legislation, there. They're able to almost assume guilt, and that obviously affects how journalists works, but it affects how we live our lives and how we, as citizens, live our lives in this country. And I think what we saw um, on the video uh, this evening, I think it's part of a, a whole wider issue of what's actually going on in this country in terms of uh, surveillance and, and, and data retention and, and data protection. There's something really, you know, I find uh, something very alarming going on. If we look at the amount of CCTV cameras in this country, more than any country in the world, we look at what the Home Office are trying to do in terms of DNA uh, databasing ID cards. I think if we add all of these things together, and I'm not trying to assume anything, I'm just trying to uh, flag these issues. I think we're looking at this massive, big, huge, weird, gray area of what's legal, what isn't, what can I be prosecuted for, and what I can't. And it is, for me, as a, as a, as a photographer, as a reporter, as a, a, as a citizen in this country, it's, it's extremely alarming. And why is the public not you know, up in arms about it? They, they don't seem to mind very That's much. That's a good question. Yeah. I'm the public. I'm, I'm talking yeah. about it now, so yeah. <laughs> on and, and, record. And because of that, is that why people think, well, actually, as the public, we've rolled over and we, did, we buy it. We buy into it for some reason. Just, just on that, I mean, uh, particularly with the Ford Intelligence Team officers who you know, know who's who covering protests, 
Um, I talk to anarchists, I talk to environmentalists, <laughs> I talk to people <laughs> that I'm photographing. I wouldn't have got, I mean, the stories have worked on The Guardian this year, the, the Police Guardian, this one we just seen, uh, there was one about playing stupid um, uh, a few months ago, uh, being targeted by police officers, um, and uh, the one, uh, the, the, the anti-fit watch people. Um, wouldn't, those stories wouldn't exist if I wasn't out there on the front line speaking to people, getting to know what's going on. Now the police see that, and it's like, hmm, you know, they don't. Think that's about that kind of decision that they make about, you know, what, you know, good, bad, legitimate, illegitimate. But that's doing our job, and unfortunately, I don't think those officers at that level get get it. Um, and I think that, you know, that's that's a, you know quite a serious point. Peter, do you want to make a comment about the data? Uh, yeah, well, I can't comment about the Eon database no. or whatever it is. It's the first I've ever heard of it. <laughs> it's all news to me. I was like, perhaps I was living in some sort of fool's paradise for 30 years. I don't know. But anyway, um, but I think the more general point about you know, the surveillance society and data and all the rest of this, I think it's very interesting. And we, I think what's missing at the moment in this country is a really sensible discussion yeah. about this. The whole thing's become politicised for various reasons and uh, it may be we need to get through a general election and then people can sit down again because there have been some ridiculous data losses um, people leaving CDs on trains and all this sort of stuff there's almost a, seems to be a, a point of view that says well if the government can't look after data they shouldn't have it in the first place but I think the trouble is that ignores the actual public benefits that can come from properly safeguarded properly used uh, information you need that sort of information to make a society run properly. But at the moment, last year the Home Affairs Select Committee published a report, 117 pages, and it's called Towards a Surveillance Society or something like that. Three of those pages, as far as I recall, actually set out some of the potential benefits of data being capable of being gathered, analyzed, and so on and so forth. The rest of it was going from the presumption that it's inherently a bad thing for the state to have data. Uh, to me, this seems a little bit unbalanced. Peter, um, just a quick question. Are you concerned personally yourself about you know, how your personal data is tracked at all? Or do, do you ever look at it in terms of your own self and think, you know, my Oyster card, my ATM card, my, you know, uh, do you ever look at it in those terms at all, or do you look at it? Well, s since there's some bastard in the Philippines who keeps emptying my bank account every three weeks, um, I've given is up worrying. Yes, really yes, yes. That's <laughs> um, yeah. I'm beginning to lose. <laughs> of all people, I know. That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's becoming a regular basis. Some guy was going around New York the other day, emptying all the liquor stores on my card as well. So, uh, yeah, of course, I have a concern about data. I think it's hugely important that the data should be properly protect it. And there need to be proper safeguards and people who treat it uh, in the slack way in which we've seen uh, is completely unacceptable. Um, but it needs a, a sensible discussion about it rather than sort of slogans being banged around. Um, you know, CCTV does have a huge potential. It's not properly exploited yet. It's not used in a properly focused way and they're private systems, public systems. There's no regulation about the whole thing. You know, it, 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 but you it, use them all, don't you? To, as a, oh, you did. Yeah. If you were doing your counter-terrorism stuff, you would presumably go and get everyone's CCTV and they'd all hand it over. Yeah. Private, public, council, whatever. And then they would spend forever looking through it to try and find out who did what. Yeah. Um, to, and you got it. You got your information. It, it's so hugely useful. Work for you. And it, it is interesting, this thing, that the public aren't really making a fuss about it either. Which is surprising. Just on the counter-terrorism thing, I mean, I've covered a lot of right-wing Islamist protests over the years. And the Ford intelligence teams would be there collecting evidence. Um, and various different groups that have been, were prescribed later on. Um, none of that material from the foot, the fit, the criminal intelligence database ever ended up in your... Well, on, on, on the Islamist groups, yeah. it probably has. I hope right. it has. So as head of counter-terrorism at that time, I, I, you, I, were you aware of that? I'd be hugely disappointed if it wasn't. So you're aware that these databases exist in public order and that stuff's feeded into counter-terrorism? Well, of course it is. Right, OK. It'd be ridiculous if it wasn't. Right. I'm not saying it happens for all, all types of demonstration, but for something like that, where there's linkage, uh, if you look at some so of the groups... Would, what about animal rights as well, I suppose? That would be the same thing crossing over into... It's well known as an animal rights national index that has been for years, right. donkey's years. So there is a link between public order policing and counter-terrorism? In that sense, animal rights national index. No, not counter animal rights and but not terrorism. Right wing Islamists on a protest. Some particular groups that were later prescribed that material collected by Ford intelligence team officers. Very likely, go from their database to your database. Quite likely. Okay, I'd hope so. And the public would 
probably think that was okay. Well, obviously, if uh, well, if someone hasn't committed a crime, maybe not. Mm. But I still. We are sorry. We need to report it as well. Um, yeah. But it needs but, to be reported by the think, press. I mean, I, I'm not saying I agree at all, but I just think if you did a kind of public poll, they'd say, yeah, that's fine if it's. Peter's way of getting to the bad boys, that's fine by me. Do you want to a quick question over in the corner there? And then I think... Perhaps the issue about people's information being used is because is, uh, your question about why people aren't concerned about it being used is to do with that they can't see how it's being used. And I'm trying to think of an everyday example about such that they create some concern, and that was Google Map, I mean, Google yeah. Street View. And uh, how many people in Britain uh, registered some concern about that? So quite possibly there needs to be some, th if you could visualise how, visu rather than that sort of creepy stereotype thing that an awful lot of British documentaries do, and honestly, I've got to stop it, you deserve a slap in the head for those things, but do something more intelligent with infographics to show how everyday, an everyday person's stuff has been used. And uh, there was something else, I can't it remember. It's interesting that it's the Google Street stuff and a kind of you know, middle class reaction, probably shouldn't say that, but um, that's done it, and not CCTV, which is probably affecting far more people. But Angus, you wanted to say something. Well, I uh, want to add a small point is that there's also got to be a question raised about uh, even when the government has data, and even if they're not losing it, um, there is a concern, but I mean, look at the case, the recent case, Danosonex out on license, and its data not being shared properly between agencies, Baby P, uh, you know, actually an organisation set up to share data on, in this case, a, a young child, um, not being shared. Uh, uh, Mohammed Sadiq Khan was on six MI5 and police databases before 2005, and there's a question marks about how he, you know, he wasn't higher up the threat list. That's a whole other debate which has been well trod. But I think that there is a question about how this data is going to be used and whether it's going to be used effectively or not. And, but all through uh, this evening, I think there's a common thread where there seems to be a blurring between someone who is a persistent protester and someone who is a terrorist. I mean, that's important. I mean, the plain stupid investigation that Paul and I did um, was about, it was about a, a, a young woman in Scotland, a member of Plain Stupid. Uh, she was arrested for something to do with public order. She was brought into uh, the police station, spoke to some officers, um, and we never actually got quite to the bottom um, what kind of officers they were, special branch, whoever. Um, and they were definitely going down the line of, um, wanted, they wanted her to be an informer. And this is all on audio, and it was and it's published on the Guardian website, so you can listen to it yourself. But it was about this idea that the line they were going down was, um, we're, we're not, we're not um, interested necessarily in you or Plain Stupid, we're interested in people in Plain Stupid who are going to close airports down. And uh, it's that kind of idea that they were going, you know, they were you know, peaceful activists, peaceful direct action, violent extremist terrorism. I mean, this kind of line that's going along. So. The, you know, we're talking about the right-wing Islamists might be a protester might end up on a, a counter-terrorism database, um, the animal rights person or someone who's committed a, a crime, that, like, especially if they did a bomb, obviously that's logical. But uh, environmentalists who are doing peaceful direct action, um, them being investigated and targeted by the state in that particular way, I mean, uh, is that a correct thing to be doing in a, in a, in a democracy? Uh, certainly, uh, Margaret's point. I, I think in a, if you take a, if you did an opinion poll, uh, for what it's worth, it would, most people would say I'm delighted that the police are gathering intelligence and data on people who, who go to um, uh, animal rights protests or uh, who, who, who try to scale an airport fence. I mean, most people say I don't want my holiday disrupted by these people. Um, police, go ahead. You've got carte blanche as far as I'm concerned. So I think the, the broad um, public view is behind the police gathering this intelligence and data. The serious questions have to be asked by us as journalists and we have to put under scrutiny where this data ends up, how it's being used and why is it the authorities, even when they have this data, fail to catch the real <laughs> bastards, yeah. if you like. And it, it's interesting that they go, um, uh, that, well, people don't mind being photographed on CCTV everywhere they go, um, but actually I have <laughs> noticed at airports people have reached their tolerance level, that if there's a really big queue, then there's a massive amount of impatience. And so there is a point at which people will say, no, but it's, it's as long as they can still freely move and are being photographed, it's as if most people really don't mind. It's when their ability to move around and do what when they want is affected, their inconvenience. But 
I think there's, that's, there's a lot of generalizations there, and yeah, they they are the, the public mind, the public yeah, mind. That's for sure. They might like this. They might like the state targeting. But, but it's you don't see a debate on it, do you? Well, I think there is a debate taking place. It may not be represented in uh, some of the organisations that we have or do work for. Um, I think I mean, that's Peter changing. said there should be one, but there's not a big public uproar, is there? Whether we, I mean, in, uh, I, I in this room, I think you'd have a different view. I think I people's experiences um, change their views on this. I mean, you get. Um, you know, some cleaners at a school that are striking over some pay and, uh, you know, the police come along and photograph them. Uh, that might be like, what, where did that come from? Why is that happening? And before, they might have been those people who said, well, yeah, you know, if they're doing something wrong, you know, that lot protesting, who cares? But I think that when people come up against this, and I had that when um, at Heathrow at the climate camp in 2007, you, you've got people in Simpson Village, you know, nice, lovely old ladies who don't want their husband's grave to be ripped up, um, protesting and, you know, with these, you know, environmental, you know, quite full-time environmental protesters, um, but they're suffering under counterterrorism legislation, Section 44 at that time. I mean, I think that starts changing the, the discussion, and in the, in the fact the police end up um, uh, losing, um, they're not winning hearts and minds on that one. Um, okay, very, very last point over here, and then I'm going to close it, and people can carry on just um, on one to one talking. Well, very quickly, panel, one point for the press is actually to change the way that they report this political position generally. The, the Guardian is doing great stuff and the, it was a very good panorama program, but the rest of the press aren't reporting this. One of the problems is the acceptance of what is being done in the name of counter-terrorism amongst the population at large, as, as Margaret says, and the press actually have a responsibility in that, in the way they cover the issue. I think we should have more uh, media than the Guardian and the BBC investigating this kind of thing and alerting the public to limitations on our liberty in the name of counter-terrorism. At which point, thank you very much indeed um, to our panel, to Turi and Mark, to Angus and Peter, and thank you all for coming. And if you have any other questions, come up here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.